Hi again, everyone. My name is Mark McKenna, and I'm the director of the Notre Dame Technology Ethics Center. Along with my colleague, Elizabeth Reneris, the director of the Notre Dame IBM Technology Ethics Lab, I'm very happy to welcome you to today's installment of our Spring Speaker Series. As those of you who have joined us for our previous talks will recall, this series focuses generally on the role of technology in promoting mis- and disinformation. We've had a range of speakers, some academics, activists, practitioners, with a variety of different perspectives. Today, we're lucky to have two more leading thinkers in technology law and policy, one academic and one activist practitioner, and they're gonna discuss the toolkit for addressing problems like mis- and disinformation, and especially the importance of interdisciplinary teams. So I'll first introduce Ryan Kahlo, and then Elizabeth will introduce Mutali and Conde. Ryan Kahlo is the Lane Powell and D. Wayne Gittinger Endowed Professor at the University of Washington School of Law. He's a founding co-director of the Interdisciplinary UW Tech Policy Lab and the UW Center for an Informed Public. He's a leading scholar of law and technology, a board member of the R Street Institute, and has affiliations with a range of leading academic and policy organizations, including places like the Stanford uh, Law School Center for Internet and Society, the Yale Law School Information Society Project. And he serves on the advisory boards and steering committees of groups like the University of California's People and Robots Initiative, the AI Now Initiative at NYU, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and the Center for Democracy and Technology and Electronic Privacy Information Center, which most people know as EPIC. And Mutali Kande is founder and CEO of AI for the People, a nonprofit creative agency that uses journalism, TV, music, and film to challenge existing narratives about technology. She's an activist with a background in journalism and legislative policymaking. Mutali has worked on key technology related legislation, such as the Algorithmic Accountability Act, the uh, Deep Fakes Accountability Act, and the No Biometric Barriers to Housing Act. At present, her work is focused on the intersections of race, technology, and justice artificial intelligence, and perhaps most relevant to this speaker series, organized mis- and disinformation campaigns, particularly those targeted at Black and minority populations. Mutali is a lab-sponsored fellow at Notre Dame's Institute for Advanced Study. She's a fellow at Stanford's Digital Civil Society Lab, an affiliate at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center, and her work has been featured widely in the New York Times, Harvard Business Review, and Fast Company, among so many other outlets, and we're so delighted to have Mutali with us today. Well, thanks very much to both of you guys for being here. This is a really great uh, conversation I'm looking forward to. Um, so we're gonna do this kind of um, Q and A style and um, maybe alternating uh, who's asking the questions. But I first wanna just let the uh, folks watching know that um, in the chat, uh, you have a link uh, that you can send in a Google spreadsheet to send in questions. We'll leave plenty of time at the end for audience questions. So please do use that and send them in. Uh, Okay, so Ryan, I'm gonna start with you. And um, as I mentioned before, and as you and I talked about this series this spring has been focused on technology's role in promoting mis- and disinformation. And I know that's a topic you guys have been working hard on at the Tech Policy Lab. And I wondered if you could just start by telling us a little bit about the work you and your colleagues have been doing. Sure, well, thank you, Elizabeth and, and, and Mark so much. Um, and Mutali, so great to see you again. Um, I, I really uh, admire your work uh, a lot. Um, so we have a, an interdisciplinary center here at the University of Washington called the Center for an Informed Public. And it's uh, the mission of the center is to um, study and resist uh, disinformation and misinformation. Um, and the center bridges um, a number of different disciplines, but um, most prominently information science um, human-centered design and engineering and law, although we have affiliates in everything from biology to computer science um, to communications and, and so on. Um, a lot of the work that we do is research just trying to get a sense of what is going on, right? Um, and so that will be um, uh, a function of, of just getting access to enormous volumes of tweets, for example, or um, you know, really getting into uh, different kinds of environments and figuring out empirically what's going on. Um, but we're also really interested in translating our insights into education, into policy. Um, and so uh, uh, quite a lot of our focus 
goes into um, you know figuring out how to how to train train folks to be better at at understanding this information to try to figure out um, how to um, uh, provide disincentives and to and to and to and to try to prevent uh, disinformation and so on. Um, but but a lot of what we do is, has been research focused. Um, and so what are we what have we been doing over the last year? We've been around for about a year. A year is you know we've been putting out academic papers. We're doing things like Miss Info Day, where we get hundreds of high school students in and we talk to them about you know tools to do this. We've been doing a series with uh, NPR, a KUOW, uh, where each of our PIs have, has talked about about our, our lens that we approach this issue. Um, but uh, so a lot of different activities, um, and uh, and yeah, so it's been it's been very exciting. <laughs> it's been very, it's been quite a time to launch. <laughs> I assume that Miss Info Day is not a how to. Thing. It's not a yes. Yes, we train we train high school students and how to get involved in uh, in you know no no it's 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 a it's an amazing thing. Um, it, it's my colleagues are have been doing it for a, a, a while now, but now it's under the banner of, of the center. People like um, uh, Jevin West, my colleague, and and um, Emma Spiro, and it's it's amazing. You 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 it used to be in person now now online, but you just get these smart eager. Um, you know, great students who, and you try to talk to them about, you know, how do you know when something is, is likely misinformation? How do you, how do you um, uh, not be part of the problem? How do you check your instincts to, sh to, to, to share it? How do you help to, to convince people um, that what they're seeing is, is, is not right? It's just giving them a, 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 cr a critical toolkit, um, yeah. which, you know, frankly, <laughs> I think, and I bet Mutali agrees with this, but I, I'll let her, to say for herself, but it's like I, 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 we have to be doing education at from like my colleague Kate Starber talks about, you know, K to ninety nine. You know what I mean, like at all levels. But it seems like high school is a good place to 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 start to focus because they they're starting to have those critical skills and they're confronting a, a, an unbelievable misinformation environment. Yeah, great. So, Matalia, I do want to loop you in here in just one second, but I just, Ryan, I wondered if you could, since three of the four of us in this conversation are lawyers, this might be obvious to us, but I wonder if you could sort of tell the rest of them, like, you know, what is a law professor doing in that lab? Like, what role, what unique skills or background are you bringing when, you know, so much of what we hear about in the way people are studying misinformation is being done by, you know, computer scientists, by people in information schools with different kind of tools. What, what do you bring to that lab? Yeah, I mean, so so that's a good question. So um, you know, we are are one of um, a handful of of uh, uh, Knight Foundation funded centers, um, several of which have law and policy as a as a component. Um, and you know, as as one of the PIs, you know, my my role at one level looks like it's oh well, there's a policy dimension to this. Like someone needs to know Section two hundred and thirty. Someone needs to know. The First Amendment and the like, um, but over the past year, what's become really obvious to me is that there's actually, um, you know, quite a deeper and more and, and important role for for people who do law and policy, like myself and Mutale. But um, and that is that you have to take these empirical, hard-fought, scientific, you know, as much as possible empirical insights, where you're. Um, complying to a, a standard of, say, you know, sociology or information science, where you're trying to get at how the world is, what is really actually happening. And then you're having to translate that into recommendations, prescription, um, in some cases, you know, art and storytelling. And that is not an easy transition for a lot of empirical academics to make, right? A lot of the other disciplines they don't, they don't sort of truck in normativity the way that, that law professors do. I mean, one of the things about law professors, you could say a lot of, of, of things about us relative to our colleagues, but one of the things that we do is we have a, a, a relatively good facility jumping from the descriptive to the prescriptive. Um, and so one of my roles has been really taking our empirical insights, our deep empirical insights, and then translating them you know, into more of a prescriptive sometimes normative sort of take on the world. Um, another component of that is um, now I'm getting involved earlier and earlier at, at the research phase of the center, trying to help us frame our research questions in such a way 
that that plug more directly into ongoing conversations and policy. In other words, we you know we, we everything that we do it's at the center. It's 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 academic interest. It's what the PIs are interested in, what our postdocs are interested in, what our students are interested in. But when we go to do a project, we think a little bit about how to frame it in such a way that the answer will help to answer a puzzle that policymakers have and overcome a hurdle that they might be running into. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed that aspect uh, of the of it. And it turns out that law professors are not terrible at that. They're not law professors as as we don't do a lot of interdisciplinary research necessarily. But when we do, you know, one of the things we're able to do is, you know, we train our students to get a, a sense of a very complex set of issues to be able to well enough to be able to persuade and argue about it right so we have a facility with with trying to get our our minds around a new context in an efficient way and then talk about it fluidly right and then in addition we're we're really more, more so than almost any other discipline we're really interested in bridging that that um descriptive to prescriptive uh barrier and those are two advantages i've, I've found have come in to play in the center. Great, Elizabeth, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I'd love to bring Mutali into this um, to even broaden what we're talking about when we talk about interdisciplinarity. So certainly we can talk about bringing different academic disciplines together. I think one thing that particularly strikes the lab about Mutali's work and how critical it is, is about how she brings communities together and you know different groups that may not be collaborating. Mutali, I was hoping you might give us some examples of the way that you're bringing in uh, the arts and um, other communities that aren't typically part of the technology ethics conversation um, and some of the great success you're having around doing that. Um, for example, I know that we're aware of your, um, your advocacy around ban the scan um, and the amnesty campaign that you're working on. Um, so please feel free to share more about the work that you're doing in that regard. Yeah, sure. And um, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me back. And I love um, any opportunity I can get to be with uh, my colleagues at Notre Dame is, is always a pleasure. Um, I am going to answer that and just give a slight hook to what Ryan was saying as well in terms of the importance of lawyers actually in this work and people who are policy thinkers. So um, AI for the People, which is the organization I run, um, start to think about race-based disinformation around Ryan. You were the first person I actually talked about with the uh, race project. And we probably had that conversation maybe 18 months ago. And because Ryan came from a legal framework and understood that what I was speaking about were uh, potential civil rights and voting rights issues kind of leapt in. But at that point, the lab hadn't really started. I hadn't really started, but it was really having that one person that understood that voter suppression had legal implications that, in my opinion, helped um, bring the amazing colleagues along. So subsequent conversations with Kate Starbird and others. So I can I can leave that there. And that was really helpful because I honestly don't think that we would have got traction um, without him. And given that so much of our conversation requires, so much of our research requires um, an academic partner, we now feel that we can go to Ryan's lab and say, this is what we think we're seeing. We need to get the data from Twitter. You know, let's think about something. So that aside, in terms of bringing um, arts and culture in. So I'm coming from a journalistic uh, background and everything that I do and the reason that I exist on earth is to make sure that the quote unquote uh, trained by the BBC average person would understand this. So for the last 20 years, I've been telling stories about everything from why feeding um, antibiotics to chickens will is really bad for us because it seeps through into our systems. We won an award for that through to um, why people shouldn't play football uh, or rugby. I was in the UK at the time, rugby, because if you hit your head too much, you're not gonna be able to think, through to um, eventually technology. And so when I was coming to this work, I was really coming through the lens of, if this cannot be understood by the ordinary person who then is gonna have agency in their own life to intercept because 
as Black communities and as minority communities, we don't have the same level of trust in the state and policy systems that we're going to be protected, that we actually have to intervene way earlier than it would take for a law to be passed or for people to even think that race-based disinfo, disinfo is a thing. And the reason that I chose art and culture is that in terms of being a translator, we were very concerned that so much of the um so much of the advocacy that's going on in this space and so much of the research that's going on in this space is really about the, the sky falling down. Like, oh my God, this disinformation, the Russians are coming, we're gonna get you know a, another bad president. And that is not how we galvanize people to action. We actually want to galvanize people to action through hope, through joy, through curiosity, and through hopefully having some fun. So gamifying, gamifying people into becoming warriors for truth, right? How do we get people to self-identify as defenders of their of, of democracy in our work or defenders of the truth and then act on this? And this is really a strategy that we um came to by uh, colleagues of the New Georgia Project and others as we were in conversation about re um race-based disinfo, and I'll never forget in same foot who leads the New Georgia Project saying, you know, culture is going to beat strategy anytime. So if we can find a way to tie an existing narrative in the way that Ryan describes to a disinfo, uh, to, to a disinfo intervention, then we're going to get the, the eyes of the people. And so we did uh, two things. I can certainly talk about Ban the Scan, but in terms of disinformation, we partnered with moveon.org, who are a large progressive um, organization during 2020. And we were very specific about going to Philadelphia because that's a majority black city within a swing state. And we were interested in some of the narratives, online narratives that we could find that were being targeted to folks in that city. And um, our PI on that particular project was from the uh, State University of Buffalo. So working with their lab, got um, access to the Twitter uh, to the Twitter host. And then we were looking for specific instances where Black people were being told not to vote at the presidential level. We didn't care about the whole ballot as much as we cared about that part of the ballot, even though we probably, um, given the insurrection, <laughs> looked at a bit further down the ballot too, but that was our target. And then we made videos. So we figured, how can we inoculate uh, Black folks in Philly? So we found what we called micro-influencers, which were essential workers, some of whom had had COVID, COVID, uh, people that were working in coffee shops, people that were in religious communities. We told them that um, COVID was, we, you know, we, we didn't tell them what the disinformation uh, narrative was because we didn't want to further spread that. Uh, that's a strategy called strategic silence, which um, our colleague Joan Donovan and Dana, Dana Boyd have uh, written about extensively. And we just asked them to think about an alternative. We, we were basically like, alternatively, what, what matters to you? And it was COVID. And we developed five in-person videos across the city of Philadelphia. We tied them to music and narrative and they, they went viral and they ended up being getting higher levels of engagement than the disinformation um, hashtag that we were following. So that's just one very discreet example of how when people who recognize each other as being credible, people who are invested in something changing and the change we were looking at, the, the change we were pushing up against was the US election. But more importantly, when the people who are holding the expertise are, are not just uh, white people or white academics, but you know your regular person on the street, it, we were really very interested in uh, thinking about how that could move more and then uh, certainly in other responses, I can talk about much more of the film work and now actually television work that we're beginning to do um, around this as well. Oh, that's great. Um, so I, I guess I want to, um, Ryan, I want to ask a little bit, um, especially because I think Matali's beginning of her answer, especially talking a little bit about sort of the relationships between various different groups. I wonder, I know you've been working on a book, sort of thinking about the toolkit for regulation in law and technology and 
and how you might think about like what kind of disciplines are necessary to be at that table and you know what teams interdisciplinary teams both for sort of mis and disinformation specifically but also for just kind of thinking about law and regulation because i think that uh, the, the last couple of answers really nicely, I think, reflect the mix. And I, I wonder kind of what you've taken away from that. Well, let me just say that that um, I, I completely agree with Mutali. And I wanted to add as well that, you know, there's there's work, just to be perfectly frank, there is work that the center doesn't feel it can do well because of a lack of diversity. Um, so, for example, if what you're trying to do is study um, uh, disinformation campaigns that are specifically targeted at Black Americans, you, you know, you, it, you can't do that research without having folks on your team who have that lived experience and without reaching out not to non-academics who are the people who are actually doing that. And Mutali has, has repeatedly uh, mentioned, uh, said that, and, and it's absolutely right. Um, and so, so there, there's knowledge that we felt we couldn't gain because uh, we didn't have that that capability, um, and that, in, in that, of course, um, Mutale with others built uh, in order to get to, to to understand a context, you know, and then from there, um, you know, having having uh, a better understanding of that context, then we can bring to bear certain other kinds of uh, data-driven analytics tools that we might have, but we never could have gotten in there. I mean, you, you see what I mean? And so, like, that, I have to say that that is not only is it critically important to bring people along um, from from as he's put it, just like. Uh, you know, person on the street, um, non-academic, but also to have people helping you do the original work so you can understand the context. And, and again, you tell you've said that to me many times. So yes, uh, Mark, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, um, about how to bring um, a, a little more rigor, a little more consistency, uh, a bit of a methodology uh, to law and, 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 poli and policy analysis around technology. Um, because it's been my experience over the last decade that at least with um, you know, legal academics, that almost every um, tech, law and technology pr project seems sui generis. You know, it's just like I, 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 I'm, I've come to this, I've come to this place where now I want to talk about the the effect um, of augmented reality on contracts. You know, well, why augmented reality? Oh, I don't know. It just seems important, right? Well, why contracts? Well, that's what I work. I work on contracts. You know what I mean? And so, and so, like, okay, so you come up with a set of recommendations. You know, what's your what's your normative baseline? Are you trying to restore the status quo ex ante that that augmented reality has displaced? Do you have some other normative vision? Uh, do you think that augmented reality can bring us to a place where? Um, you know, uh, uh, if anything, we have a, a greater obligation for some particular values. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to work on is how to, how to approach technology and legal analysis. And, and to me, that, that um, is, is really best done in an interdisciplinary mode because it involves steps that different disciplines are better at. So for example, the first step of the methodology has to do with carefully defining the technology under examination. In particular, what about it is definitional and what about it is contingent? So we talk about augmented reality. We don't just take whatever the current most popular instantiation of augmented reality might be. Rather, we ask how does augmented reality differ from previous and constituent technologies like the tablet or the computer or, or whatever it happens to be. And that often requires people who are working in that space and understand the technology uh, non-contingently. Um, the next step, and I won't go through the whole thing, but this is another example. The next step involves understanding what that technology changes about human affordances. That is, what can people do now they couldn't? What can't they do? What do they do differently? And often that requires careful qualitative study that is best um, conducted by people with qualitative training, whether they be in information science or science technology studies. Um, and it's only a few steps later when you get to the um, systemic um, uh, uh, analysis of what assumptions of law and policy no longer obtain or what institutional configurations, legal constitutional configurations um, no longer make sense. Only then really do you, do, you, do you draw deeply from the legal methods as it were, right? And so um, I, I think that a lot of these things can be done by a single person. And I think they, they and I think a, a single legal academic doing these steps in a more careful, rigorous way would, would be better. Um, but you know, my, my own impression is that if you can build an interdisciplinary team, <laughs> you're gonna be better off.
Yeah, so Natalia, I think your, your uh, description earlier of your kind of engagement with some of these labs, I think reflected a lot of the themes Ryan was talking about. So I wonder if you could just, you know, uh, elaborate for us a little bit about like, how is it, when, you know, when you're doing your work, when you're doing it, um, what are the points of contact between you and organizations like Ryan's lab or like the technology ethics lab here at Notre Dame? Like where, where do you find it most fruitful for you to fit into that interdisciplinary process? So as part, part of our mission is to reduce racial bias in tech. And we define that as shifting policy with a big or a small P, right? So big P policy would be, um, it's really illegal advocacy, which is just drawing on a field of work that I come from, or small P could be even after our disinformation work, we're in um, an ongoing conversation with Twitter around their content moderation policy and how we we think it, it should change. And the way that the way that we would come in is we have the belief, and I, I wish I had said this, but I didn't, Rashad Robinson of Color of Change taught, taught me that in order to shift policy, we need to have people on the inside writing the statute and people at the door demanding the change, right? So we're always um, interested in looking for a sta written policy, which acts as a basis for us to decide which P we're pushing. So in the case of, um, in, in the case of the Ban the Scan campaign and some of the work that we're doing with facial recognition here in New York State, what we're looking at is we're a justice-based organization. So we're not interested in informing rights unless those rights are going to um, break down other systems of oppression for the most marginalized. So when we're looking at facial recognition, we're not just looking at the technology itself and, and saying whether it should be banned or whether it should be a moratorium, even though I do have huge um, opinions around that and you can read about that, but we're looking at the system of policing and we're looking at as a system of policing, what do we actually want to do to uh, make that a, a fairer system for everybody in this country. And where we would go to a lab is, um, we would, we would go to them and say, we're interested in looking at the, uh, the system of policing. Our lens is how policing is becoming a technical project. Our interests are biometrics. And in the case of New York, the S-79, which is a Senate bill, was has ended up being our target. The reason that we went to S-79 is the first pre provision of that bill is to ban police use of uh, facial recognition. Uh, I'm sorry, biometric technology in the state. The second provision is to then have a statewide task force to decide if and how tech these technologies should be used in the future. And then the third is a sunset clause. And as a justice-based organization, we looked at that statute and we said, you, you, you know, 10 out of 10 for provision one, zero out of 10 for provision two, because those task forces tend to be taken over by pro-police forces. And before we know it, the task force would have said, we really need stingrays and we'll be back. So then we would run to um, the, ethic lab, the ethics lab at Notre Dame or to Ryan's lab and say, we have this, uh, we have this idea, but how do we get, how do we look to move this towards making sure that police forces uh, in New York, in this case, cannot use military grade information inf information weapons against civilians. And we would then look to other statutes like um, Virginia have just passed a law that we're really interested in. Uh, New Orleans have just passed a law that we're really interested in. And it's in that back and forth that we do our best work with uh, legal practitioners in this area. The reason I'm so excited for or Ryan's book is that it's really, really, really touch and go. I've been doing this advocacy work now since 2000 and, oh God, I'm old, 2014, 2013, 2014. And it, we had some good people. We, we were really, you know, I, I read Danielle Citrin's name somewhere about five years ago. I don't know where, this is before this was MacArthur Genius. Danielle Citron. This is when, you know, Danielle was a law professor and she said, she put me in touch with Marianne Franks and I said to her very specifically, we're interested in content moderation. I am not interested in litigating section 230. 
what other legal strategies could we use? And they brought to us the consumer law lens, but they also left with us the idea that Section 230 is really about speaking up against the, the state. And even though Twitter and Facebook are, are transnational, that may be a, a misuse of freedom of speech, you know, it may, it may be a misuse. And I was then able to invite uh, Marianne up to DC and we were able to argue that point, but we, don't hold those resources. Uh, we don't. We don't hold those resources and expertise online because all we want to do is to build enough of a knowledge base within the general population that you're going to have those people at the at the streets to say, actually, I didn't know that I cared about law and tech policy, but if you marry it to policing, and I care about policing or housing or employment or food distribution, and I care about these issues, I actually care about tech policy also. I, I just want to jump in on that and just just um, mention as as um, a strategy. I mean, if you look at what happened with net neutrality, right? On on the one hand, you had um, the fact that John Oliver took an interest in net neutrality was really important because then he did this amazing explainer and people could understand like, oh, this is why it matters to me, right? The fact that, that John Oliver had access to Marvin Amori, a former law professor who works on net neutrality to help with that episode was incredibly important too because Oliver didn't make mistakes and and knew what what the policy discussion was so that he could frame his comments right and that relationship between Mutale and Marianne is is similar right where where Mutale has this has the ability to to tell the story to frame it in a way that people can understand and that, that resonates with them but Marianne has that 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 um, in the weeds um, policy in law experience precisely about intermediary liability and, and it's just that's that's how these things work when you bring people like that together so building on that point ryan uh, in this speaker series we've tried to very strategically pair academics and practitioners in a conversation about the challenges posed by mis and disinformation on platforms um, and as you know, while the Tech Ethics Center here at Notre Dame is really focused on academic research and providing the theoretical foundations for this work, the lab uh, is more focused on producing research and artifacts that are really targeted at practitioners in industry and in government, civil society, um, and more. So as experts who've worked with both academic and practitioner focused communities, how do you view the relationship between those communities um, in this conversation? What are the, some of the challenges that you've encountered and perhaps some ways that you've been able to successfully navigate those challenges in your work and some lessons even for how we continue to collaborate across the academic and non-academic circles. Um, Mutali, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, so um, I've been, you know, I've, I've really highlighted uh, the best um, of the collaborations that we've had, but there is, a sense of like the academic hero saver savior complex that we sometimes get because there is an element of this work that that gives um academics public you know public profiles that they may not have had prior um a, a relevance to their work that may not have been there and are, are, are climbing that public intellectual ladder and so they will use community and they will use these projects done within community to get there without connections to community and i'm, I'm obviously not going to name any names but we've had to really have strategic uh conversations with the board about how we have to divest from from certain academics because it's very clear to us that they're really not interested in an ongoing conversation we have a five-year narrative change model and um, the and for the first two years are you know we we kind of build credibility for the issue once we have credibility for the issue we then build community around that issue and try to st and that's often where we'll get the labs involved and say you know this really 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 came up and th this is you're not having a voter suppression conversation without understanding data sets how can we 
in the right, you know, coming to 2022, 24, how, how can we collaborate together? And I have to say, um, Kate Starbird, just as an individual, not as a person in the lab, is someone who was like very quickly, along with Renee Donesta over at Stanford, very quickly reached out and they were like, what's the next step in this? So that would be an example of building um, that community because they know that we can't get access to some of the, the, the basic data without an academic partner. Um, but they're also not coming to try and lead us either. They're literally coming in as a resource. The third part, once we've socialized it, is to do another experiment that increase the field. So instead of one city, we might go to three cities, five cities, a state, whatever. We then want to um, show a proof of concept. So we're only in our second year, but year four, we would love to start writing reports with our partners to say what we've seen over the last four years and then be very prescriptive in a, legit, in a policy uh, discussion because what we have at AI for the People is um, access to the to Congressional Black Caucus, AI Caucus, Tech Accountability Caucus, and others who we've been in relationship with over the last 10 years, and then bring in this work that we've been doing with the Academy. And then year five is actually divesting. We want to have built enough capacity within that community that we stand back. And that really requires a level of um, a level of humility that the tech industry generally doesn't have and um, the academia doesn't always have. And so we're beginning to try and uh, choose our partners really uh, carefully. I, I mean, full disclosure, Ryan is a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine. I really appreciate that we have the relationship we do. But even in the act of writing the book, he's not coming in to save Black people from the internet. And there are people who, who really believe that that's their goal in life. And that's sad. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I um, don't have the same um, lived experience, but I have witnessed the, the dynam dynamic that Mutale is describing. I mean, so one of the things that um, has been really influential about my own thinking in, in this area has been something that um, Mutale wrote actually uh, with Daniels and Muir about it, uh, advancing racial literacy in tech. Um, in, in an ideal world, what you would do is co-production. That is to say, you'd, you'd pick the, the things you're looking at and, and the ways that you're doing it and the outputs all, all along what you would do is you would work with the communities and, 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 and for the communities you're interested in, in um, uh, you know, for, for whom you're interested in addressing the issues that they're facing. Um, at the Tech Policy Lab, um, we have uh, not done that as, as, as much as we might, but we have recognized that there is um, a, a sense in which tech policy recommendations themselves, things like white papers and outputs and, and whatever they happen to be, um, tech policy tends to reflect the mainstream. And even if that mainstream is more progressive, and even if the mainstream is this and that, and that um, still that's the case. And so what we developed was um, a formal method called the Diverse Voices Project, in which we take our early stage um, policy recommendations and we um, uh, convene experiential experts from different communities that might be affected by it. And then we present them the issue, we present them the document, and we ask, you know, what's broken? And so that might mean that um, we talk to people living um, with disabilities. Uh, we might talk to folks who are, have been formerly incarcerated. Um, and in addition to people with that lived experience, our experiential panels also consist of uh, people who uh, study or advocate on behalf of those groups, because sometimes the individual might have the lived experience, but not see the patterns that you see from advocating on behalf of a community. And so we, we vet our work product that way. Um, and I can tell you just from experience that it is objectively greatly improved the work product of the lab to go through these processes. And then we've documented how to, to do that 50 some odd pages with scripts and step by steps and everything. And we've also trained other organizations and other other individuals in the diverse voices method. Um, I just want to acknowledge right now, however, that that is not exactly what is being recommended by the community. That is, we are we, we, we have brought we have picked the topic and brought the white paper along to a particular point. 
before we are vetting it with these with these communities. Um, and so it's not true co-production, but it's an initial step that we've taken in recognition of the way in which, you know, academics look and 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 act and and know a certain way. Um, and uh, and anyway, it's 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 really dramatically improved our work product. And just very quickly, one of the things that we found, and this is what I think the lab I'm hearing um, is going on with you, you guys at the lab, Ryan, is that you have a great idea, you put it on paper, you hit community because we're a communications firm. We are not a civil rights firm. We are in service of translating this research, right? So we found that we have to do a lot of world building because just because I've been speaking about facial recognition for God knows how many years, it doesn't mean that anybody in the communities that I'm interested in, you know, black and brown communities specifically, are thinking about these issues because there are closer quality of life issues that they are more interested in, specifically around COVID. So even with the disinformation work where we produce this video with um, Amnesty and, you know, EFF and all of these people, oh, you know, that's really great. Um, we go and we start going to community board meetings here in New York um, as, as part of our ethnographic work. That's how, as a journalist, I understood what communities actually thought about an issue, I'd have to go into community. And we find that not only are police, uh, people who are working on police and, and interacting with the NYPD in their volunteer time because they're so passionate, want police, they thought that we were lying. They were like, facial recognition totally isn't a thing. You watch science fiction, go away. And we had to realize that not everybody is you know, in this bubble that we're all in. So we've now had to add this other element of world building through narrative. And that's why TV, film, uh, coded biases uh, streaming on Netflix as of today. That's why we, you know, we're working on another film with a production company that looks specifically at the movement, not so much the science, but getting back to this idea of people see themselves in an issue, they'll move on that issue. Um, that we the we're still learning uh you know we're still learning ourselves I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dialogue is what i'm is what i'm hearing which is that on the one hand you might be bringing issues to a community that they hadn't thought about but once they do they they understand why it affects them materially um and other times sourcing your projects from things that are bubbling up yeah um, i mean so when it, we, we have um uh, one of our our, our postdoc, uh, Lasana Magasa, um, he uh, is taking a diverse voices methodology, and he's yeah. been applying it. And he got a chance to himself select what are the kinds of tech issues that he wanted to work in. And um, Lasana grew up in um, in Harlem. He's a Muslim um, African American, and uh, his first one was I want to I want to talk about COVID. I want to talk about vaccine distribution. I want to talk about testing inequity and so on. And so he selected that. That um, that um, particular lens, I, I would guess, I would think in part because he knows there are communities that are that are very affected by it. Of all, of the wide range of things he could work on, that's what he gravitated yeah. towards. But you know, it, 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 he's one individual <laughs> of right. a dozen in my lab. You know, he's, it's it's not the same thing as 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 going to those communities. And I'll say very quickly, um, just in response to that, because I know we want to get to questions. There is a lot to be said about the way academics train people. So on this um, facial recognition project, we're working with uh, Meg Young, who who's a UW graduate. Um, we, you know, speaks. Her and I have a lot of the same influences. She's now a postdoc at Cornell, but. She is so passionate about using this diverse voices methodology and without her, um, and Meg is a young white woman, without her, we probably wouldn't have even realized the date, some of the data that we would have to overcome, some of the misconceptions that we'd have to overcome because her insistence through this diverse voices training was, well, if we're gonna frame this as policing, this broader issue that is already in the public attention. It's already in the public imaginary. We're not even a year from George Floyd. We're going through, through that process. Let's actually think about what it feels to be in a high crime neighborhood. And, you know, I just don't live in, in those areas. And it was really interesting 
Um, and I, I hope that more labs um, and, and more institutions really offer that opportunity for this type of critical work, because ultimately we're, you know, our mission is to get legislation passed that is gonna protect the most vulnerable people, but we need to do this foundational work first. So since you both brought up uh, popular culture, Netflix encoded bias, which is a really important film. The lab is encouraging everyone to please watch uh, in the context of the technology, technology ethics conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you both about another Netflix film, uh, The Social Dilemma uh, that you may or may not have seen, which has been raising some eyebrows in the STS or science and technology studies uh, community, uh, both academic and practitioners alike. Um, and go back to something you said earlier, Mutali, about the importance of framing the problem. Um, so I'm curious what, uh, you know, whether you wanted to comment on the film or just talk about how uh, narratives and storytelling are really important to your work, but it seems can also be problematic and challenging, particularly in thinking about how to come up with really effective uh, solutions or even things like legislative and regulatory interventions. So for example, in some of the recent hearings with some of the tech CEOs, we've seen how some popular framing can sometimes um, lead to some complications in terms of, of solution, uh, solution focused thinking. So whoever wants to take it first, please feel free to jump in. So I was horrified. And the reason I was horrified was um, it really fed into this single genius narrative that you can come out of the tech world, you know, you can go into the tech world, you can create a company, sell it to Google in the in the case of Tristan Harris, and then um, how I don't know, on the road to Damascus, be like, oh my God, I'm doing so much wrong and I'm gonna fix it. When in actual fact, there are two decades of work and I may be undercutting that, but there, there are two decades of work of people beginning to ask as soon as John Perry Barlow was like, there is no race on the internet. There were people saying race matters all the time, every day. And, and no, we're going to create the knowledge that, that underscores that point. And I feel that while the film made some really, really good points, it completely erased not just um, the amazing community of uh, Black female scholars, starting with uh, um, starting with Latasha, oh gosh, please do not let me say her name incorrectly, at Harvard Kennedy Peterson. Latanya no. Sweeney. Latanya Sweeney, thank you yeah. so much. Starting with Latanya Sweeney um, at Harvard Kennedy, finding that she could find, uh, you know, get around HIPAA laws through uh, using the governor's name, which I thought was ingenious, through to her name being linked with uh, bail bonds ads on Twitter. I mean, this, this woman is a leading STS academic. Why would she need bail bond? Oh, of course, because her name has been coded as black through to um, much more recently, Ruha Benjamin's seminal book, uh, Sophia Noble, um, Joy. Joy hasn't done that much academic work, but certainly Timnit through her work at Google, which ultimately um, got her fired. And I'm always very proud to let people know that Timnit did ask them all to read um, Advancing Racial Literacy in Tech, and they said there was no racism at Google. So uh, make of that what you may. But it really erased all of those people and all of those perspectives and then the incredible policy and advocacy work that had been uh, that had had been done with legal scholars specifically those that were not considered to be at the upper echelons of the legal scholarly um of the legal scholarly world and were were much more interested in listening to minoritized communities and women like me who were saying we cannot just we can't ask if people's 13 year olds use Facebook. We need to really, really think about how can we fundamentally shift. So um, I, I feel that if we're gonna have a narrative, it has to be an honest narrative. There, can no be, there are no heroes, we're all in this together. And if we all play our specific part, we can get to better solutions, which is the work that Ryan is doing. I also think that there are real world policy, there are real world implications of that single narrative, that single genius uh, narrative. And we've seen it as uh, Tristan Harris is repeatedly called to give testimony and, and that be an entered into the congressional 
national record when it was a very, very narrow view that was, that was given. And then from a funding perspective, I don't know if people uh, were watching 60 Minutes yesterday, but Darren Walker, who leads the Ford Foundation, was really speaking about the type of um, the type of investments that Ford are making, and they invest in this area. And it becomes really easy to do what I call social justice washing, which is very much like tech washing, where you say one thing, you co-opt other people's work, and then you get all the funding. And um, that just further marginalizes people who are the most impacted. Um, that was a lot. So I'll let you go, Ryan. I mean, I agree with everything everything you just said. I, I would say that, um, and and by the by the way, one positive development has been that finally, 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 some of the major funders, including corporations, are giving to historically black colleges. Do you know what I mean? Like the million dollars to to Howard is a huge deal. Give give to Howard, don't give to Harvard. Harvard's going to take your money and put it next to the other money. Give it to Howard. <laughs> anyway, that <laughs> that's beside the point. Um, so, which is not, which is not not even the same as giving it to communities on the ground, because of course Howard is a is a prestigious university, right? Um, so, the other thing I would say is that um, I watch social the social dilemma. Um, it, it's easy to poke fun at it because it is so sensational. So sensational that it in fact uses some of the very same kinds of techniques. That it criticizes, you know, um, in order to dramatize for you how scary uh, some aspects of social media are. Um, but it, it it it's the the problem with the social media uh, with with the social dilemma ha has to do with its misunderstanding about the kinds of damages that artificial intelligence and social media are really doing. So it foregrounds the least plausible in some ways idea that we're being pre-programmed like machines and that none of us have free will anymore. You know what I mean? And that kind of thing, right? So it foregrounds that for you, which is something that as a person who has actually sort of barked up that tree myself for a long time, it's really hard to get policymakers to actually make a change about that. If you go to policymakers and you say, we're being controlled by, by social media, they say, well, show me the evidence of that. Show me the harm. Show me this, show me that, right? And, and in doing that, in addition to the erasure that I agree that with Matali is, is being done with the previous work, it, 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 it ignores some of the incredibly extractive practices of artificial intelligence and, and social media. Things that, for example, Kate Crawford has documented in her book, uh, Atlas of AI. The, the, the materials coming out of the ground, the enormous use of energy, um, the 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 uh, uh, reification and reinforcement of this incredibly sort of Tayloristic re like just everything is about about how to categorize and you know it's it's it, the, the point of the matter is is that there's some things that are going on um, that are really material and theoretical that that are not really touched upon and it reminds me um, of something a colleague once said which is that power has a really interesting way of um, supporting and bolstering and putting forward its weakest critics. That is to say, if, if you, if, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's to say, if you, have a, if you have a criticism that's easily weathered, you're going to be put in front of people. And by the way, I, I, this happened to me. Happened to me. Um, and so, so, so that's really the danger with this. You can sort of poke fun at, at Tristan Harris for saying that no one got upset when they introduced the bicycle, when in fact everybody, of course, freaked out <laughs> when the bicycle came along and there were like these op-eds and these sermons about how horrible the ills of the bicycle. I mean, he doesn't know, it's okay. But but you can't excuse the idea of only focusing on sort of the least plausible harms that are being done by some of these systems. Um, but I do agree that some of the some of the, the the claims that the social dilemma made, it made in a way that really got people's attention and really did get them to focus on some real problems. And I, I do credit the, the movie for that. I yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely agree from a communications perspective. We definitely um, got eyes, but it was difficult to keep eyes because you know when you're saying things like, we really need a field of study that looks at science, technology and society. And I'm like, 
like the, lots of people do that on earth and have been yeah. doing that for a really long time um but but I would definitely agree but that doesn't mean that I disagree with the form it doesn't mean that I think that this should stop being done. One of the people um, early on were asking us, you know, why are you interested in content, um, content production? And I was saying, because I've spent 20 years around lawyers. And they said, well, what do you mean? And I said, I'm interested in the IP. We also own the IP. And that's one of the ways that we know that we can continue to do this work because we can relicense our work, we can create curriculum, we can, and this is also, it, it hasn't quite worked out yet because we've never found a big enough partner org to come in um, with us on dissemination, but I'm sure we will. And they were like, huh, we never thought of that. And I keep reminding them, I'm Zambian. My name is Mitali Nkonde. If you want to have a conversation about AI or, qu or quantum computing, go to sub-Saharan Africa and look at how those economies are being positioned to create these parts, positioned to um, really do all of this harm to themselves. And there is no critical lens. And I know when Google opened in Ghana, because I was... Um, working with the Congressional Black Caucus at the time, they thought that that was the best thing that could ever um, happen for Ghana. And I was the lone voice. Now imagine if we could somehow disseminate um, the idea that, that this is a transnational, uh, trans sector, um, you know, consideration and, and our very environment is on the line, but we don't feel it here in the United States. We're getting a little short on time. This has been a great conversation. I wonder if in just a couple of minutes, we might um, end by asking, you both talked about the, you know, the significance of taking all the learning you're developing, all the work you're doing and translating it into policy, Natalia, you said into, into legislation. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit about, um, from both of your perspective, you know, just in a, maybe a couple of minutes, what's the concept that's kind of most missing um, in, that, in that conversation? But by which I mean, you know, the the kinds of things that are possible legally at any given moment depend on kind of the way we frame what the goals are of the of whatever kind of regulation. So I wonder if you could just say a little bit about like, even though there's lots more attention on a lot of these issues than there was even just a few years ago, what, what's most missing from the conversation right now? Um, I can say in a sentence and I'll let Ryan finish. Um, marrying harm to um, existing civil rights protections um, and, you know, relying on ethics, which doesn't really define harm and makes it very difficult to legislate. Yeah, I agree um, with that too. Uh, I, I would say that, that the thing that I've been thinking a lot about is the role of uh, deterrence. Because the truth of the matter is, is we talk a lot about platform liability and, and the like, and there's good reasons for that. Um, but some of the sources, the worst sources of disinformation are these quasi-state actors that need to be deterred at a uh, transnational level, you know, at, at, through, through diplomatic and economic uh, forces. Um, and in addition, one of the pictures that's emerging from the research, which is why empirical research is so important, is that a relatively few group, number of people um, for very specific reasons of their own um, are way disproportionately spreading misinformation um uh you know it's, it's like you can identify this sort of handful of people that cause it to to really spread and some of their reasons have to do um just as much with um selling uh vitamin supplements than they have to do with democracy or with their their view about you know freedom or something like that right um and so i think we really need to be honing in a bit on what are the incentives of the people that are creating and spreading this information who are roughly identifiable um, and, uh, and how do we get them to stop using legal tools? And I don't think we talk about that enough because I think we, we I, mean, I think lawyers often assume that there's, there's no move that can be made because of the first amendment. I don't think that's, that's right. Elizabeth, you have anything else before we close out? We have about one minute left, so. No, I think um, we're going to have to have these two back in conversation yeah. <laughs> because we could go on all day. Uh, but in the interest of time, I think uh, we're probably best to wrap up.
Yeah, well, actually, thank you. It was a really great conversation. I think you guys illustrated a lot of what we have been thinking hard about in terms of the way that, you know, the center and the lab work together and that the engagement that we have with uh, lots of different kinds of communities. And you guys have been ahead of us in that respect and have given us a lot to think about. So I really appreciate you both being here. So thanks to Ryan Kahlo and to Natalia and Conde. Thanks to Kelly Mitros and Nicole Mackley for all the organization and the team at ThinkND. And hopefully we'll see you guys next time. Thanks very much. Thank you thanks, so much. Thanks, everyone.